Hi, I'm Linda Deer. Two Saturdays ago, I read to you from chapter three of my true life story, Guided. Her spirit guide angels were her best friends and life coaches. I read about how everyone here let me down. One of the first things I remember my spirit guides telling me came from this prophecy. The promise that life will get better for you as you get older. Then came the warning. If you can make it through childhood. I received this prophecy years before starting school and just like the merry-go-round dream. It was something I could not stop or change as they continued to repeat this prophecy to me word for word throughout my childhood. I was living in two worlds without anyone noticing. While my secret world was uplifting, a place where I always learned amazing new things. In this world, I was constantly critiquing what to say and strategic about how I acted. I was living a secret life that my spirit guides played a dominant role in. Today in chapter four of Guided, I'll be reading about how school exposes me as an oddball. It turned out that school was boring for me and I didn't, and I didn't fit in. So far, I didn't fit in anywhere. This real, realization just made for a stronger connection to my spirit guides. Even though no one expressed or demonstrated anything close to what I was always experiencing, I knew nothing was wrong with me. However, I did realize that talking about any of this was not an option. So sit back and relax as I tell the story about how, des how despite the family function, my spirit guides took me on one journey after another that led to me, that led me to a greater understanding of myself. Chapter four, school exposes me as an oddball. When I started school, I thought it would bring freedom, at least from my mom. Instead, school became a challenging necessity of life for me. I was disappointed because what I had discovered from my inner world, from my guides, had no value there. School was all about achieving outer world learning and experiences. It took me some time to wrap my head around that. Until school, I had been in an exciting, rigorous, self-expansive place of learning and discovery that was much more challenging and interesting than any of that school stuff, which I found mostly boring. The forced approach to learning I encountered at school was a ridiculous way to teach anyone anything. I saw that I saw right through that because I already had superior teachers, brilliant ones, not from this world. Their training was much more rigorous. They taught me complicated lessons that made that they made easy for me to learn, which also encouraged me to know myself. Being in that school environment required that I dumb myself down. I was really an oddball now. Mm -hmm. I was only starting school and my life had already felt long and drawn out. Having friends was not important to me because I already had the best friends anyone could possibly ask for. And they were as real to me as anyone I had ever met here in this life. Because of that, I never settled for friends just because that's what they called themselves. I found that most kids didn't know what having a real friend was like. What's more, 
I found that the kids in school didn't even know who they were. They thought they were who they were taught to be by their parents. I knew they were much more than that, but they didn't. I was only five, but I really had a mind of my own. I didn't do things the other kids did, like cry for the smallest reasons, let alone the bigger ones. I didn't blindly do everything the teacher told us to do in an attempt to be liked or to fit in. I saw doing that as a game of manipulation for the land of lost souls. I did what I loved to do, no matter what the other kids said about me. Because of that, of course, they were always judging me. Even so, the social part of school was easy for me because I was not invested in making friends. I was open to having friends, but I wasn't going out of my way to please anyone. The part of school that was hard for me was doing everything the way they told us to do it. No exceptions. I found school to be a very rigid place that went against my way of learning. I felt like a soldier, not a person, and I found that humiliating. The other kids complied with the rules and control because they were afraid and didn't want to get in any trouble. They would do anything to make the kids and teachers like them. I saw that fear was what motivated them to buy into these control tactics. I saw that as a, I saw that as a total sellout but I was the only one who saw it. Ah, I thought, these are the fear-based people in the merry-go-round dream. Some people have considered me rebellious, but I was just seeing through all the politics around the kids and the teachers. I didn't, it didn't take me long to size up the school situation. Everyone had a motive for wanting us to do things or act a certain way. It wasn't what was best for us. It was what was best for them. Everyone was doing what they were told to do. Before entering school, I was accustomed to seeing things for what they really were. I also saw my place in it. This would have never been possible without the training I received from my guides. Learning. The life coach training you receive from your guides can make you appear to be an oddball. After all, you see everything for what it is and you conduct your life from the truth. Societies, politics, and threats just don't work on you when you pay attention to your guides. Every day there was playtime in the kindergarten, in the kindergarten classroom. The kids had to rotate each activity so everyone would have an equal time to learn and play. My project of choice was the building blocks. They were large wooden blocks of different shapes and size, sizes. I loved them so much that I had to have them every day. I would give the other kids my lunch, toys, candy, or money to get them to give me their turn at the building blocks that day. I was obsessed. I didn't understand it then, but that was no accident. It would prove to fit into my calling later in life. Being in the classroom day after day felt like being stuck in a slow motion movie. Most of the time I was bored out of my mind and could hardly stay awake. I used, I was used I was used to learning through self-discovery with the support of my guides. When something interesting did occasionally happen in class, I would usually miss it. Later, my guides, later my grades would suffer because of that. I just couldn't connect with that ponderous mode of learning. I quickly became frustrated with school, invented my frustrations on the tetherball court. I skipped lunch so I could play tetherball. Before long, no one would challenge my place on the tetherball court because no one could beat me. 
I have a strong will and have and I found that when I wanted something, I got it. Working out my frustrations through my passions and exercise became a real saving grace for me. Throughout kindergarten, I was mostly left alone by the kids and teachers. Even so, I kept my eyes open and occasionally saw teachers abusing their positions. I think it was just from the frustration with the kids. I remember one teacher who dug her fingernails into a boy's arm so hard it made him bleed. I saw that she was a lot like my mother, attempting to control us kids through force rather than reason. I had no respect for her, and I pretty much questioned everything she told us to do. The other kids just went along with the agenda and accepted what she did. They didn't seem bored like I was. They could stay focused in class and they played well in groups trying to be liked. I was the opposite because none of that appealed to me. My behavior grew, drew a line between me and them early on. I was being me and they were being who they were programmed to be. It was the only thing they knew. From my experiences in kindergarten, I realized how different I was. Until then, I was just secretly holding my ground. As I was learning even more about myself, my real self, with the loving support of my guides. It was because of them that I had such a strong sense of who I was early in my life. Learning. Getting to know who you are is the most important thing you can do. Without that, you will never find your place in this life. You've seen people who don't do that. They are fear-based, always floundering, and needing to be told what to do. They need consistent validation when you are learning from your guides, getting to know who you are is the strongest part of their curriculum. Once in school, it didn't take me long to realize I was a tomboy. I liked sports, but not the team kind. I liked games where I could rely on my own abilities. Thanks to my dad, all of us kids were seasoned water skiers before we started kindergarten. We also had our own gasoline-powered mini bikes, bikes before we were even in school. <laughs> My dad built our backyard like it was an amusement park with larger than life slides, swings, slip and slides, pogo sticks, and stilts so tall that you had to get on them from the top horizontal eight foot high fence rail. Every kid wanted to play in our backyard. By today's standards, that would have been a colossal legal liability. But in those days before we became, but not in those days before we became so litigious. My dad was so much fun. He worked hard and played hard. And what he couldn't afford to buy, he built. There wasn't anything my dad couldn't do or anything we couldn't have. This is where my dad excelled. My dad did have an unusual quirk, though. The only way I can describe it is that it seemed like excessive energy would build up in him, and we'd, he would have to release it from time to time. He did it by rubbing his hands together really fast while he held his breath. When he exhaled, the release would come in one big rush. He would only do it for about 30 seconds or so, and then his en energy was balanced again. I remember doing something similar uh, to release the stress, my stress, when I was beginning being trained by my guides to see things with uh, outside of a linear vision tip. Your guides know you better than anyone else. They are masters at aligning you with exactly what you are ready to learn at just the right time in your life. 
That's why they don't think of you as being too young or too old to learn anything. To them, your age has nothing to do with it. I knew my inner life was different from that of most kids, but I didn't realize that was true with my outer life also. I learned that one day at school during show and tell. I told the class about an excursion my mom and dad had taken us on the previous weekend. It involved hiking up a roaring waterfall and grabbing a big vine and swinging over the chasm created by the falls. Before I could even finish, the teacher told me to sit down and stop lying. She might not have believed me, but every word of it was true. In addition to going water skiing uh, two or three times a week, my dad and mom took us on white water rafting trips and we would travel to remote places on our motorized mini bikes. In the incident with the waterfall that I had tried to relate, when I impulsively swung on the vine, my dad freaked out at first, but he quickly got into the spirit of the occasion when he saw that I was fine. Having paved the way, everyone else wanted to do it too. I was always the fearless one because that's what I was encouraged to be from my guides. We traveled to places where we would discover Indian ruins with their original primitive tools laying all around. This was one area my mother excelled. She was a researcher and would map out exotic hard to get to sites to see if we could actually find these places on our weekend outings. We were always going on adventures to discover mysterious locations. One place was about 75 feet above an ice cold, walk of ice cold clear, calm river. The water was so clear that there was no way to determine how deep it was. My dad dared us, me and my uh, other two brothers, to dive into the water and retrieve a dead snake at the bottom. I dove in and still remember the head pounding feeling of the ice cold water. Despite the cold, I went deeper and deeper until I finally got the snake and brought it back up. My dad smirked. He knew I would always be the one who took that dare. <laughs> My mom and dad were also treasure hunters and we were thrill seekers long before they started making TV shows and documentaries about people like that. Extreme living is what we did, but because I had no basis of comparison, it was all normal to me. Until the teacher told me to stop lying in show and tell that day, I didn't know just how different my life was. With that incident, I realized that I had even less in common with school with the school reality than I thought. Unlike the other girls, I had no interest in brownies and Girl Scouts. I was living fully immersed in the things these organizations only provided a taste of. I was beginning to realize I was living a very different reality from most people I knew in school. Like the merry-go-round dream showed me, many times my life would be the opposite of others. My first experience with how things worked in society came in the first grade. The kids in my class had already learned to play peer pressure politics in kin kindergarten and had picked their friends who would best serve them in that. They were well into the process of becoming experienced manipulators. One of the most effective methods for asserting control they had was learned through bullying and in the first grade, the bullies were out in full force. It all came as a shock to me. I may not have liked school up until then, but I really didn't want to be there after what I saw. On top of all that, my first grade teacher was even worse than the one I had in kindergarten. I was really having problems wrapping my head around all this dysfunction. I had never taken this stuff serious, seriously, but now it needed to be dealt with. I was become, it was becoming institutionalized. 
The kids were no longer innocent and open. They were clearly on a mission. They had decided who fit in with them and who didn't. Guess who didn't? My parents started hearing about my nonconformity at, at teacher parent meetings. They decided one way to deal with it was to give me more homework and my mother was supposed to help me with it. That made me somewhat independent. I didn't, I did uh, better than I did with the kids around me so much. My resistance was strong, but I knew that resisting would only make things harder for me. So to combat the school politics, I decided to focus all my attention on the academics and turn my back on everything else. The first grade was a difficult adjustment for me, but I got, but I got it worked out so I was able to get passing grades. But living in, the two, in two worlds was what I was really perfecting. I also began to experience what it's like to be at odds with both the teachers and the bullies. I was tolerating it acceptably well until I saw that the mean kids saw what the mean kids did to the kids who were outside of their group, outside of their clique. That was not okay with me, and I started to stick up for the underdogs. I began with warning the boys not to pick on the kid, the other kid again. But that didn't go over so well, starting my fighting career. I always let the bullies hit me first because I really couldn't fight until I got mad. Although once they hit me, I rarely lost a fight. I learned to fight without any real training. I think it came naturally to me because it came from the heart. I could not stand by and let bullies pick on the nice kids. I was never the instigator, but I was always there to finish something the bully had started. With my new fighting career came a revolving door of school suspension and readmittance. Without seeing the big picture, adults viewed me as a really bad kid. But I knew I wasn't. It was, an, it was another calling. Until I went to school, I didn't realize this part of me existed. I found I was almost compelled to protect those who couldn't protect themselves. Before I started school, Larry, my little brother, had been my project as I showed him how to overcome his fears and defeat his opponents in smart ways. But I hadn't known this would extend to people outside my family. Looking back, a, a lot of my life was filled with balancing injustices and confronting bullies. Tip, never let a bully slide. The sooner a bully is confronted, the faster you put him or her out of commission. Schoolyard bullies are a festering sickness in our society because they grow up to be monsters. As time went by, much to my surprise, I discovered that I actually did fit in after all. The school and neighborhood I grew up in was mostly African American with a fair number of Latinos. Next came Asians and Caucasians who were always in the minority. I'm Caucasian, but I found I fit in best with the African American kids. It was the late 1950s and my African American friends liked and disliked the same things I did. They liked dancing and the same music that I liked. They disliked the bullies and white kids who flaunted their privilege. They didn't like my mother. I'm sure they could feel my mother's racial biases. They liked chasing me on my mini bike and fighting with me. They were the best fighters, athletes, and dancers, just like me. They also were the funniest and most real people I had ever met. They told me things that I knew were the truth. I had a special affinity for my African American friends because of the injustices they all faced. 
It was almost like society was a big bully toward them. I think that was the single most important reason I favored them. The white kids knew, the white kids I knew were not nearly as classy and poised as my African American friends and their families. Case in point, I would stop by my white British friend's Rita's house to walk to school with her. Her dad would be walking around the house in his underwear right in front of me while he shouted at clients on the phone. On the other hand, I would stop, stop by my African American friend's house, Nori, to walk to school with her. Her mother would have me sit in the living room, turn on the cartoons, and serve me breakfast. She would close the doors to the living room so the family could get ready for school and work in privacy. They were very polite, modest, decent people. As I settled in at school and started having friends, my life began making a little more sense. However, my mother, who was not fond of black people in general, didn't approve of my choices. Of course, that did not affect me one bit. She just used my choice of friends to justify her deeper resentment of me. She became more intense as the years went by. I began to see she was like the school bullies and that she would abuse her power. I was disturbed to see this and I was ashamed of her. I was hoping that my African-American friends would never find out that my mother was a bigot but they were smart and very intuitive, so I'm sure they knew. I was the only white kid with African-American friends, it being the 1950s after all, but I didn't think about it at the time. I just knew that made what made sense to me, so that's what I did. Tip, since your guides always show you everything for what it is, the truth, what works for you may not fit society's idea of what's acceptable. That doesn't mean it's not right for you. Maybe society is wrong. They certainly were wrong in my case when I, a white kid, chose American, African American friends, kids as my friends of choice. So next Saturday, I will be reading from chapter five of Guided, The Consequences of My Choices. Although my secret life with my spirit guides and angels remained intact, my character was revealed. My mother used that against me. My spirit guides were my only lifeline now. The love and trust I had with all of them was so enormous, steady and true, that I could ask them anything and get the answers whenever I needed them. But I was becoming numb to this world. So until then, remember, you have help. You are always being guided and you are never alone. <laughs>